Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, uh, a pro-European think tank um, based in London. Um, I'm going to be discussing today with the chairman of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, uh, the state of post-Brexit relations and negotiations between the EU um, and the UK. Um, like myself, John Stevens is a former Conservative member of the European Parliament. We're going to start by talking about the polemic and controversy about COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, obviously, that's been a, a, an issue which the government uh, has used um, uh, through its um, media supporters to present a very unfavourable and hostile view of the European Union over the past few weeks. Um, but over the past few days, um, uh, a softer, a more conciliatory tone seems to have entered the debate. We're told that both sides are looking for a win-win situation, and there may be an agreement negotiated by Tim Barrow um, at the beginning of this week. Um, do we regard that as being a, a, a change of, of heart generally by the government, or is it specifically um, that they're afraid of a, a, a vaccine war, as it were, with the European Union? Uh, interestingly, I think that we've got the European Commission's uh, propaganda or publicity uh, about the number of vaccines that have ex been exported from the EU to the UK um, has hit home. Um, so perhaps uh, the government has really changed its mind, or it may simply be a question of, of a government that has no strategy for Brexit and oscillates from one extreme to the other. But what do you think the significance is of this change of tone? Well, there's certainly been a change of tactics from the British government. Um, because I think they recognize that there is a severe danger from any uh, restriction of exports uh, from the EU to the UK, given the risk that they've taken in going for a very aggressive first shot strategy and having a delay for the second shots, um, which has laid behind many of the, the very good figures that have been achieved by the UK. So I think that danger has been a restraint. And uh, this change of tone, I think, is, however, merely tactical. Um, I don't think it reflects uh, the longer term interests that the British government have in maintaining a fairly abrasive relationship with the EU for internal political purposes, particularly ahead of the forthcoming elections um, on May the 6th, above all those in Scotland. So it is your view that in general, the British government wants to have in the coming months a, a fairly abrasive and um, confrontational relationship with the European Union? Well, what they're trying to achieve is something which uh, British governments have been doing for, for, for a very long time. Indeed, many European governments have been doing for a very long time, which is having two messages, an external one, which is conciliatory and an internal one, which is aggressive. Uh, the side problem is that it's very difficult to keep these separate for any for any length of time to anybody who is um, able to look at uh, the foreign media. And it's particularly difficult when the contradictory messages are being presented in English, which is so widely um, read and understood throughout continental Europe. Um, Absolutely. If the Danish government find themselves in, in the position of wanting to put forward a contradictory message, um, they're not likely to be confronted with uh, Danish newspapers um, that are brandished in their face by somebody who's read it uh, over the weekend unless they are themselves a Dane. That's right. But I think what, what lies behind this has been the fact that the British government has adopted a much higher risk approach to dealing with COVID than have the Continentals for a range of reasons. And that's the underlying cultural difference, I think, which uh, is significant here. And in some respects, that high risk approach has led to problems. I mean, earlier, the uh, rather reckless approach that the Prime Minister took towards going into lockdown and things last year uh, was uh, a high risk approach, but equally the high risk approach to uh, betting a great deal on getting vaccines and getting them quickly um, has paid off. The slight problem with this is that it underlines that the whole Brexit strategy is actually extremely high risk for the UK in a whole range of ways, economically, politically, geostrategically. And my fear is that in other areas, notably Northern Ireland, uh, this high risk culture, which seems embedded in the London political scene at the moment, 
um, could have very serious negative consequences. And one of the places where it might well have negative consequences, of course, is in Northern Ireland, which has um, shown a sharpening of the tone over the past week or so. The remark of Lord Frost that um, uh, the protocol couldn't be made to work until uh, everybody uh, accepted its workings was, was an invitation, it seems to me, um, to the DUP to exercise a veto um, over the working out of a treaty that the government itself has signed. Um, we know that, um, that the British government uh, is, is now under legal pressure from the European Commission um, on the subject of, um, uh, of grace periods, which unilaterally the British government ha has established. Um, uh, how worried are you about this um, future development? And, and what do you think the American reaction to it is going to be? Well, the Americans have already indicated that uh, there would be no question of a trade deal uh, between the UK and the US if uh, the current agreement is not implemented. And uh, the problem is that the power of that has diminished somewhat because the chances anyway of a trade deal between the UK and the US uh, really in the first term of, 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 of the Biden presidency, if, if, he, is, um, if he seeks another term, um, is very small anyway. I mean, the, the expiry of the fast track arrangements in Congress for trade deals uh, really makes any chance of uh, a major US-UK agreement in the next four years, I think, quite limited. And of course, given that, uh, the UK government may well conclude that it doesn't have that much to lose uh, from a more aggressive tone in Northern Ireland if that pays off dividends in shoring up its domestic political position and above all in uh, offsetting any danger of uh, moves towards independence in Scotland, which is the real concern that the British government have vis-a-vis -vis developments in Northern Ireland. It's not so much Northern Ireland itself, which they've been prepared to sacrifice um, in order to secure Brexit. Um, it's more the danger of a knock-on effect from developments in Northern Ireland, particularly another border poll um, uh, being proposed. Um, that would lead to another poll conceivably being allowed or being pushed in Scotland. It's Brilliant. not just a, it's not just those questions, is, is it? It's the pressure from within the Conservative Party itself. Um, a year ago, the withdrawal agreement was sold um, to the, the most radical Eurosceptics within the Conservative Party uh, as being something that um, was going to be renegotiated, was going to be torn up, was going to be hollowed out. Um, that hasn't happened, particularly as far as the Northern Ireland Protocol is concerned. Um, the ERG, the European Research Group, have called for the abandonment of the, uh, of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, uh, isn't there a danger that the government is, is simply attempting um, to uh, maintain the fiction, the rhetorical fiction of being committed to the protocol, um, but not being willing to implement it? Um, for instance, if it's not going to be possible to hold uh, uh, the necessary checks and examinations in Northern Ireland physically itself, um, then, then that hollows out and that undermines the, the, in, in the protocol, which the government itself um, signed 18 months ago. Uh, I wonder if the question of an American reaction to that is simply a trade question. I, I think that um, the government might find itself under pressure if it behaves in that disingenuous way from the Americans, not just on the trade front, but on a number of other fronts as well. The Integrated Defense Review really makes it clear how dependent this government intends to be on the United States militarily over the coming years. I think that's right. Uh, what we're seeing here is a further iteration of the, the high risk approach that uh, London is taking in, in, in this regard. They believe, I think, that they can get away with putting much more pressure, particularly on Dublin, uh, in order to uh, get the EU to uh, provide more flexibility with regard to the protocol in the hope that that will, to a degree, it's not so much appease the, the, the Democratic Unionists, but continue with a dialogue um, uh, uh, that conveys the impression that they are 
they have the upper hand in the Brexit negotiations. That they that the deal that they've done is can be can be further changed. That um, that some of the disadvantages of Brexit can actually be got round and can be renegotiated. And things. So this is a it's an attempt to create an impression that they have a sound uh, medium term Brexit strategy. And I think that could can, that could backfire. The assumption that they are making is that further pressure in Northern Ireland on the protocol will lead to greater flexibility from the EU um, because of Dublin's concerns. It may indeed have the opposite effect. And this I think is where the, the US influence might kick in. If a uh, notion gathers uh, strength that the only way out of these problems is actually to call a border poll and to create the structures in which a border poll could take place. And American intervention in that regard could be absolutely critical. Then this could backfire very seriously, because as I say, moves towards a border poll, moves towards resolving the Irish issue will have a significant impact on the debate in Scotland. And it is Scotland that is of real concern to the British government because they know that Scottish independence would be an absolutely fatal blow to Brexit and to we, the Conservative Party. Before we talk about Scotland, can we talk finally about the uh, the role and attitudes of the Dublin government? Um, you talked about the um, British government hoping um, to be able to put pressure on the EU through the Dublin government. Um, they're not wrong in thinking, are they, that the, gov the dub government in Dublin is profoundly split, not split, but um, has um, two different interests. Um, one is European lo loyalty and solidarity, which is very important to them. Uh, and the other is to try and live as easily and conveniently as possible with their, their neighbours in the north and their neighbours over the Irish Sea. Um, so there is um, uh, a cross, there are cross currents in Dublin and um, which way do you think they're going to, to be resolved? Well, certainly the British government recognised that Dublin is very frightened of any early moves towards unification because uh, the ruling parties in Dublin, uh, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, are frightened above all of the rise of Sinn Féin and the fact that the only real winners from early moves towards border poll or discussions of the process that would lead to a border poll, uh, the only winners from that are likely to be Sinn Féin, and that is their real concern. Um, so in that sense, um, the, the British government strategy is, is, has some substance. However, this is why an American intervention could be so significant, because ultimately, uh, if you believe that unification is going to come at some stage, then it, it, it should only come uh, safely with both support from the US and the EU. And if the current pressures um, don't lead to that uh, development, um, then in a sense, they will be storing up greater problems for the future. Uh, than would be the case if they were to accommodate this to some respect. And that, I think, is the debate in Dublin. Uh, has Brexit created circumstances in which, in essence, it is unavoidable now to contemplate a process towards Irish unification? Or is it still possible to postpone this uh, further, to continue with a status quo with the UK and um, with Northern Ireland and hope that the EU and the US will accommodate that? Uh, that's their dilemma. And I think that at the end of the day, um, they will come down in favor of making progress towards unification and taking this moment. But it's not a decision which they would welcome at all. There is deep anxiety about this, there's no question. Yeah. Let's go on to Scotland. Um, there's been an important development in Scotland last week, um, in news that, uh, on the regional lists of the um, Scottish election, um, there will be candidates for the for the Alba party, um, a breakaway Scottish national party, as it were. Reminds me of the, the Napoleonic palindrome, Abel was I, ere I saw Alba. Perhaps that's what <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon might be saying this weekend. Um, but it seems to me that um, uh, this is an ambiguous um, development. Uh, if the uh, 
new party does well in the regional list, they could indeed um, enhance the number of um, pro-independence um, Scottish members after, after the election. If they do badly, they could simply take votes away from the SNP and, and even um, decrease the numbers involved. Do, do you have any sense of how that's um, likely to pan out? Uh, and more generally, do, do you think that um, the Scottish electorate uh, are following uh, as closely as um, some people are in London and Edinburgh, um, the ins and outs, the, 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 the mutual accusations um, between um, the present and former leader of the SNP? Or is the commitment simply to the idea of independence and, um, and these people, whoever they may be, whatever their uh, personal foibles may be, uh, are just instruments for bringing, bringing this about? Well, I think there may be too much focus on these forthcoming elections on, on May the 6th as being decisive. Because uh, the, the British government has already made clear that even if there were to be a majority, either outright for um, independence uh, support um, or uh, from, the S from the SNP or in conjunction with the Greens or even in conjunction with ALBA, um, <clears throat> they would not uh, allow a referendum to take place. I think what, what really matters is, is whether these internal battles um, between uh, Sturgeon and Salmond um, uh, undermine the, the project of independence overall. And there I think that's highly unlikely. I, I think a, a, a parallel can perhaps be made with the uh, Leave campaign in the in the 2016 referendum, a, a lot of people believed that the clear divisions of priority and indeed divisions of personality between, on the one hand, UKIP and Nigel Farage, and the supposedly more mainstream leavers, uh, led by ultimately by Boris Johnson and, and Michael Gove and uh, an element of the Conservative Party, that these divisions um, would make the campaign less effective. But in fact, the contrary was the case that what you had was a capacity to appeal to very different um, uh, areas of support for the same proposition, namely to leave the EU. And I think there is a, a comparable situation with the emergence of ALBA, is that it may well succeed in mobilizing uh, independent support, perhaps at the expense of the Greens or, or um, more, more other um, less um, uh, clearly unionist parties. I mean, there are divisions in the Labour Party and in the Liberal Democrats on this. So I think they are the likely to be the losers um, from this development rather than the independence uh, vote overall. And my own guess is that the impact of ALBA will be to actually enhance support for independence overall. Whether that is actually reflected in on May the 6th is a slightly different question uh, because of the timescale, because of the way in which uh, the debate about Brexit and independence has gone in the last um, in the last uh, few months because of the personality clash between Salmond and Sturgeon. Um, but overall, I think what this is a sign of is of a vigorous uh, support for independence in the medium term. Do you um, think that the Conservative government will be able indefinitely to prevent the holding of an independence referendum in Scotland? Um, I can see from the English point of view, from the point of view of English nationalism, which is what the Conservative Party is about most of the time these days, um, it will be rather attractive to be seeing to take a firm line against them, um, uh, against the independentists. Um, the Labour Party perhaps could be presented as being ambiguous on this subject. Um, and um, English nationalists um, have always thought that um, the Scots um, uh, got more out of the union than they put in. This transactional view, which was so characteristic of some British views of the uh, uh, of membership in the European Union, was echoed in in much of the Eurosceptic press in this country, saying that the the Scots were a burden um, on the productive English. Um, how, how do you see that as 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 working out? Um, I can see the immediate reaction of the British government will be to say no, no, we're not having a referendum. Um, but I can't believe that that will be the end of the matter. Well, this is where Ireland is so critical. Uh, 
because I think it's quite clear that whatever happens on May the 6th in Scotland, uh, there will not be a referendum um, granted by the British government. That will, of course, uh, enhance uh, resentment in uh, significant sections of nationalist opinion in, in, in Scotland. Um, although there is a degree of caution in the nationalist camp, but represented by Sturgeon, actually, more than, more than Salmon, um, towards the timing of a referendum, because they know that uh, the, a second referendum they have to win. Um, I think if, however, there is progress towards a resolution of the Irish question with a timetable and a procedure for moving towards a border poll, that will make, with, with American and European Union support, uh, I think that would make continuing the position of not granting the Scots another uh, referendum on independence absolutely untenable. But the problem is that any such moves will lead to undermining Brexit. I mean, the, the British government knows that if they grant any form of vote, even a border poll in Northern Ireland is being considered, that reduces the legitimacy of the proposition that the vote in 2016 on Brexit was won for a generation or, and, and should not be revisited. As soon as you start um, having further constitutional uh, referendums, um, that is put back into play. And furthermore, they know that to have Scottish independence take place is a mortal blow to Brexit, Britain, and all the, the whole agenda. Uh, it's a, a blow to the, the whole position of, of Britain in the world, its, its image, even before you consider defence and, and constitutional uh, issues such as the monarchy. So they know the stakes are very, very high here. But uh, my feeling is that it, it will be developments in Ireland that could trigger the timing of a Scottish referendum rather than vice versa. All the points that you make about Northern Ireland and Scotland, of course, are, are very valid logically um, and politically. Um, but given that the Labour Party seems so reluctant to um, make controversial points, whether it's on the Constitution, whether it's on Northern Ireland, whether it's on Brexit, in particular, um, is it going to be possible for the um, electorate to draw the right conclusions, the conclusions they might logically draw, uh, without being guided by a major party of opposition? Um, aren't the Conservative Party, in their approach to Scotland and Northern Ireland and Brexit, um, greatly favoured and helped by the fact that there is no alternative analysis being put forward? Because Keir Starmer is afraid um, that whatever alternative analysis he puts forward uh, will be ridiculed and misrepresented by his political opponents. I think that's absolutely right. The Labour Party is on the way to making itself uh, extraordinarily irrelevant in this. Um, we'll have to see what happens in the Hartlepool um, by-election, but um, as a general proposition, it seems that the Labour Party is put itself in a position where it is unable to appeal to the voters it has lost to the Conservatives in the north of England, essentially on a Brexit uh, ticket, um, and on all the uh, rebalancing of the British economy that, that Johnson is talking about, the, the levelling up agenda. Um, it, that has been entirely taken now by the Conservative Party. And the Labour Party is also completely unable to uh, benefit from those in, broadly speaking, in the south of England, in London, who are um, going to be the major losers from Brexit and are going to be increasingly um, alienated and therefore potential um, strong opponents of, of, of Brexit um, and, uh, and its consequences. But the problem is, can an alternative political force emerge uh, that would threaten um, the, that area of support and prevent the Labour Party from, from getting onto that territory. I mean, that at the moment, there is the Labour Party is creating an inertia in the field of, of opposition. Um, and though that may lead to its demise, it, I don't see any, any alternative force take, taking up that space. Do you see this government as lasting to 2024? And, and if not, is there a chance of an anti-conservative alliance of some kind, of which the Labour Party would obviously be a, a, a very important member? Or, or is the, the tribalism of, of all the um, 
a party that opposes the Conservative Party um, still too great to make any such alliance a possibility? Well, I think there are two threats to, to this government. Um, there is an economic one and there is a, a constitutional one. The constitutional one we've already discussed, the, the prospects of, of Ireland and Scotland. Um, the economic one is that if we are indeed on a turn in um, global inflation and in uh, global interest rates, the British government is particularly vulnerable to rise in interest rates and a rise in inflation. We have an inflation prone economy structurally um, because of its service orientation. Um, and we have uh, levels of debt therefore, which are, are very sensitive to rises in inter interest rates, the, the debt service that, um, that is entailed by that. I mean, even the rise in interest rates that we've seen so far this year um, has almost wiped out any increases in revenue that uh, the uh, taxation on uh, the, the the rise in, um, in 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 taxation um, that were as an, was announced by the Chancellor um, would provide. So that that those are the two issues, and I those are two very very substantial crises potentially. Um, I, I cannot see a government surviving till 2024, which either loses Scotland or uh, is forced to uh, deal with um, a, a devaluation and IMF style crisis. Um, now, these, neither of these um, ex scenarios uh, will necessarily happen. I mean, the chances are still probably significantly below 50-50, but um, they are rising in my view. And, and that, that is what makes me feel that there is a significant and growing chance that the government may not survive until 2024. And do you see them as being confronted with uh, an anti-conservative alliance of any kind? Well, there I think is the problem is that it's an institutional one that the Labour Party appears to be incapable of, at the moment of really um, formulating uh, the, the, the essential core of such an opposition. Now, it may well be that extreme events, such as we've been discussing, um, would bring that about, would, would force a change. I find it difficult to imagine it being under the current Labour leadership, however. Yes, that, that there is an impression of, um, uh, of caution in the present Labour leadership, um, which was well described by the, um, by the author Professor Christopher Gray, who writes a lot about Brexit, um, and he was saying that um, uh, it's the role um, uh, of the leader of a government and the leader of an opposition to trade accusations, to misrepresent each other, as it were. And Kurt Starmer is so worried that he's going to be misrepresented um, that he'd rather not have anything to say, anything to be misrepresented, um, rather than get involved in the, the, the necessary political mudslinging and, um, and misrepresentation, if you like, um, which, is, which is essential um, to political discourse. You always have to have disagreement between the opposition and the government about who's misrepresenting whom, and then it's up to the electorate to sort that out. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, and I'm tempted to say that anyone who agrees with everything we say hasn't been paying attention. Um, thank you very much um, for today's discussion. Um, the Federal Trust, um, I would like to say to our viewers and listeners, uh, has got a, a, a website, uh, fedtrust.co.uk. If you found our discussion interesting today, you may find things of, of use, um, interest, and perhaps even amusement uh, on, on our website if you go to it. Thank you very much.